And live here on C-SPAN 3, Congressional Budget Office Director Keith Hall. He's testifying before the Senate Budget Committee about the CBO's new report on the budget and economic outlook for the next decade. Wyoming Senator Mike Enzi is in the chair. He chairs the Senate Budget Committee. Our 2.30s arrived, so good afternoon and welcome to the first hearing of the Senate Budget Committee in the 116th Congress. We have some new faces joining the committee for the first time this afternoon, and uh, while they're not all here yet because of other committee meetings, uh, I'd like to formally welcome the Senate Budget Committee, the newest members, Senator Brown of Indiana. Um, well, we'll also have uh, Senator Rick Scott of Florida and Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota. I look forward to their com contributions as we tackle our nation's pressing fiscal challenges in the years ahead. We begin our work this year by examining the Congressional Budget Office's annual update of the budget and economic outlook. Our witness today, of course, is Dr. Keith Hall, who's the director of the CBO and has probably appeared before this committee more than any other director. Um, I'd like to welcome him and the members of his team accompanying him. We look forward to your testimony. In my review of this report, what strikes me most is how few surprises there really are. As has been the case since 2002, the federal government spends more than it collects. In fiscal year 2018, the federal government collected more than three and three-tenths trillion dollars in revenue, but it spent more than four and one-tenths trillion, which means the government overspent by $779 billion. Beginning in 2022, the federal government is projected to begin running deficits of more than a trillion dollars each year. Total overspending for the next 10 years will reach more than 11 and 6 tenths trillion dollars under this forecast, which assumes no other changes to tax or spending laws currently on the books, and that's the way that it has to be done. It's an unlikely outcome, but one CBO is the one that CBO is required to project. As CBO's report shows, uh, spending over the next 10 years will grow from four and four tenths trillion in 2019 to seven trillion in 2029. What's causing the spike in spending? CBO tells us that three quarters of that two and six tenths trillion growth is attributed to Social Security, Medicare, and interest payments. Just those three things. Social Security, Medicare, and interest payments. While interest costs are tied to debt accumulation and rising rates, cost growth in Social Security and Medicare is a matter of demographics and ever-growing per-beneficiary health care costs. The number of people 65 years or older is double what it was 50 years ago and is forecast to increase by a third in the next 10 years. For years, we've known this was coming, and I welcome CBO's additional emphasis on this issue in this year's report. According to CBO, between 2019 and 2029, revenues will grow by about 5% per year. This revenue growth will result in receipts to the government that hover around the 50-year average and then spike upwards following expiration of certain provisions of the 2017 tax law. While revenue growth will be strong, it will be outpaced by non-interest mandatory spending, which will grow five and five-tenths percent per year, and interest payments will grow nine percent per year on average. 
In just a few short years beyond the current forecast, there's no doubt that 100% of revenue, that's every penny the government collects, will go towards mandatory spending and interest payments. Funding for national security, border security, education, health research will be fully financed by the nation's credit card. Becoming a nation of credit cards. Year after year, CBO's data shows that our mandatory spending programs that operate on autopilot continue to grow faster than the revenue that pays for them can support. For example, over the next 10 years, the Medicare program will spend nearly five and six tenths trillion dollars more than the program collects in payroll taxes and beneficiary premiums. Trillion dollar deficits are within sight, they are real. It's time for us all to have an honest conversation as to how we're going to address them. I believe that most of us agree that when you have 22 trillion in debt, which is forecast to grow to nearly 34 trillion in 10 years time, Congress needs to start putting solutions on the table. The fact that interest rates are rising only makes the need to act soon more pressing. Something has to change. Lurching from deal to deal under the threat of a government shutdown only leads to more spending, more deficits, and ultimately more debt. Congress must implement foundational and structural policy changes if we're to ever achieve fiscal sustainability. While this committee will be focused on leading the way to a better fiscal path, I also intend to press ahead on the committee's ongoing spending process reform and oversight work. As the nation and its leaders continue to grapple with effects of the longest government shutdown in American history, it's clear that we need to work together to improve the process by which our country budgets and spends money. Last year, some members of this committee, along with members of the House of Representatives, work to develop solutions to America's broken spending process. I salute their efforts and intend to build on their work and the previous work of this committee. I think we'll do a hearing on that. Additionally, I intend to have this committee provide continued oversight of federal spending, ensuring programs del deliver the results they were promised. There must be accountability for the expenditure of all taxpayers' dollars whether it be the Department of Defense or the Department of Health and Human Services, all spending should be reviewed. As we kick off a new Congress, I welcome and I long for the constructive input of my fellow committee members regarding areas ripe for oversight. There's no more appropriate topic for this committee's first hearing than receiving an update on the nation's budget and economic outlook. Dr. Hall, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to hearing from you today and working with my colleagues on this committee to strengthen our economy, to reduce overspending, and to put our nation on a more sustainable fiscal path. Um, at this point, we would usually hear from somebody on the, uh, the ranking member's side. Um, if they show up and wish to make a statement, we will interrupt, interrupt for that. So. Uh, our witness this afternoon, as I mentioned, is Dr. Keith Hall, who's the director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, we appreciate your work and look forward to receiving your testimony. Uh, for the information of colleagues, Dr. Hall will take up to seven minutes for his opening statement, followed by questions. And uh, we have a specific order for the questions, which I'll go over as soon as he finishes. Dr. Hall. Thank you. Chairman Inzi, Ranking Member Sanders, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify about the Congressional Budget Office's most recent uh, analysis of the outlook for the budget and the economy, which we released yesterday. I'd like to draw your attention to important information in that report about the amount of debt that the federal government will incur if we continue on the current budgetary path. I'm going to focus on four questions. First, how large does CBO project that debt will become? Second, why is debt projected to become so large? Third, what would happen if the economy grew more quickly? Fourth, what are the consequences of high and rising debt? The first question, what does CBO project? Federal debt is already large, and budget deficits over the next decade and beyond are projected to keep pushing it up in relation to the size of the economy. Eventually, debt as a share of economic output would reach its highest level in our nation's history. Let me highlight a few key numbers. At the end of last year, the amount of debt held by the public was equal to 78% of gross domestic product. 
In CBO's projections, debt equals 93% of GDP by 2029 and about 150% of GDP by 30 years from now. Even at its highest point ever, just after World War II, debt was far less than that, at 106% of GDP. Second question, why does debt become so large in CBO's projections? Now, we provided you a summary of the report, a visual summary, if you, if you have it handy. You can see the answer in the summary of the report, which we just provided you. We've summarized things in a new way to sort of help make things a little easier to, to digest. If you look at the, uh, the chart on the first page at the bottom, uh, you'll see that the, the page indicates why debt grows. Federal spending and revenues both grow through 2029, yet the gap between them persists. On the spending side, growth is driven by benefits for older people and by interest costs. Outlays for Social Security and Medicare increase significantly in CBO's baseline projections. As members of the baby boom generation age, the number of people at least 65 years old who are the main beneficiaries of that spending is expected to grow by about one third and the healthcare costs will continue to rise. Interest costs are also projected to rise primarily because of increases in federal borrowing and higher interest rates. As for revenues, they too are projected to increase through 2029, partly because of the scheduled expiration of some tax cuts at the end of 2025. However, that growth in revenues is not enough to keep deficits from becoming significantly larger than they have been over the past 50 years. In CBO's projections, the average deficit over the next 10 years equals 4.4% of GDP, as shown in the front of your handout if you look at the very first graph. That average deficit is not only large, but also unusual for times of low unemployment, in contrast to times of high un unemployment, when the government sometimes implements policies aiming to stabilize the economy, causing deficits to be larger. Third question, what would happen if the economy grew more quickly? If GDP grew more quickly than it does in CBO's projections, revenues would increase more than spending would, and deficits would be smaller than projected. If, e if economic growth was fast enough, deficits would actually shrink and debt would stabilize or, e or even fall as a percentage of GDP rather than continuing to grow. But such an outcome is unlikely. In 2018, the real growth rate of the economy, that is the growth with the effects of inflation removed, was 3.1 percent, the highest rate since 2005. Nevertheless, the deficit equaled 3.8 percent of GDP and debt increased as a percentage of GDP. Furthermore, this year the boost in that tax, tax in the recent tax legislation gave to business investment wanes in CBO's projections. Also, federal purchases dropped sharply under current law starting in the fourth quarter of this year. As a result, economic growth is projected to slow in 2019, and over the long term, output growth is projected to be lower than its long-term historical average because the working age population is expected to grow more slowly than it did in the past. Real GDP grows only by an average of 1.8 percent per year in ten year, and CBO's 10-year projections. In short, the economy isn't likely to grow quickly enough to shrink the budget deficit. We have posted an interactive workbook on our website that lets you specify different economic scenarios and see the results. For example, if productivity growth turned out to be a half a percentage point higher in every year than CBO currently projects, Real GDP would grow by 2.4% per year instead of 1.8%. Deficits would still average 3.7% of GDP instead of 4.4% of GDP. And debt would stabilize at roughly 80% of GDP by 2029. Such economic growth is possible, but is not likely under current law. CBO aims for its projections to be in the middle of potential outcomes. So there is about the same chance that productivity growth would turn out to be half a percentage point lower than CBO projects. If that happens, real GDP growth would average 1.1% over the next decade, and average deficits would be 5.2% of GDP, and debt would swell even more than it does in our projections. Fourth question, what are the consequences of high and rising debt? If debt rose to the amounts that CBO projects, there would be troubling consequences. First. As interest rates continue to rise towards levels more typical than today's, federal spending on interest payments would increase. 
surpassing the entire amount of defense spending by 2025 in our baseline projections, for example. Second, because federal borrowing reduces national savings over time, the nation's capital stock would ultimately be smaller, and as a result, productivity and total wages would be lower than would be the case if debt were smaller. Third, lawmakers would have less flexibility than otherwise to use tax and spending policies to respond to unexpected challenges. And fourth, the likelihood of a fiscal crisis in the United States would increase. In closing, I will emphasize that debt is on an unsustainable course in CBO's projections. To put it on a sustainable one, lawmakers will have to make significant changes to tax and spending policies, making revenues larger than they would be under current law, making spending for large benefit programs smaller than it would be under current law, or adopting some combination of these approaches. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Director. Um, and I also want to thank you for the product that your staff put out on some possible um, spending changes that we could, we could make, and they're designed on a sliding scale, and I have everybody looking through those, I hope. So um, now we'll turn to questions, and uh, normally I'd ask questions first, but I'm going to be here for the whole hearing, and we have a vote scheduled. Um, but I'll explain the process to committee members before we start. Each member will have five minutes for questions, um, usually beginning with me and with the ranking member. Following the two of us would alternate questions between Republicans and the minority. All members who were in attendance when the hearing started, sound of the gavel, will be recognized in order of seniority. For those who arrived after the hearing began, you're on the list in order of arrival. If it's your turn to be on the list to be recognized and you're not available, then we move, you move to the bottom of the list and we turn to the next senator on the si that side of the aisle to ask questions. Okay, and with that, uh, I'll turn to Senator Johnson, who was here at the sound of the gavel. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Hall, by the way, I, I did appreciate your summary. It's the, the charts and graphs that I was picking out of your, your larger product, so I appreciate that. I want to focus on page four of your the, the main report. And what you said in, in your testimony, you talked about the, the increasing number of retired individuals. You state a little bit differently in your report. You say, we're going to experience slower growth, primarily because the labor force is expected to grow more slowly than it has in the past. I mean, same type of thing. One of the things we're debating is immigration. How many people should we grant permanent legal residency per year? I'm in manufacturing for 30 years. It's been difficult to hire people in manufacturing for at least 20 of those years. Uh, as long as I've been a senator, there's not one manufacturing plant in Wisconsin can hire enough people. Same way in terms of dairy farms. So can you expand a little bit more? You know, from my standpoint, in economic growth requires human capital plus financial capital. Just talk about the demographics that we are facing in terms of lower birth rates. You know, Senator Purdue and I earlier talked about what, we, what should be the number of people we allow in this country in terms of legal immigration, and, and how should we structure that, you know, okay. as opposed to just family unification versus targeted toward employment? Sure. Well, well let me start with staying clear what, what I think the challenge is. When we talk about long-term potential growth being only something like 1.8 percent, there's a really simple recipe. If you look at productivity growth, if we assume something like a 1.3, 1.4% productivity growth, that's something in the range that we normally have. We've had bigger at times. And again, that, that's the financial capital aspect. That's exactly. That depends on the capital stock. That's the sort of thing that, for example, that the, uh, the, the, the tax bill addressed. The other part is labor force. We only see labor force growing about a half a percent a year. So if you take 1.3, add it to 0.5, you get the 1.8. And it's almost that, that simple. So those are sort of the two ingredients for getting long-term growth. That 1.5% is a real challenge because of our aging population. We're getting more people who are over 65. The number of people who are over 65 are getting older. Um, and the labor force participation rates of younger folks just aren't actually keeping up with the baby boomers. So we're going to see a drop uh, in labor force participation. That's a big part of why this labor force growth is slowing. So again, the numbers are pretty simple. I think our labor force is approximately 150 million people. Right, that, that's right. Okay. So if, if we want to grow faster than that, right now you're saying it's going to grow by half a percent. Yes. Uh, that, that's uh, about 750,000 people per year, correct? 
that, that sounds about right. Yeah. So if we want to grow another half percent, we need to increase our labor force by another 750,000. If we want to grow by 2%, we'd have to really grow our labor force by about 3 million people per year. I mean, that's just off the top of my head. But I mean, those are the types of numbers we're talking about. We grant legal permanent residency to about a million people. Right. Uh, what, what are you, what, what are you, what are you talking, yeah, but, but it's primarily about family unification as opposed to right. putting them to work. What are you seeing in your demographics in terms of just natural birth rate and our own population growth? And, and what shortfall do we have there? I mean, so fill in the right. blanks on the 500,000 you're basically talking about. Right, well, let me, let me mention one thing about immigration really, really quickly. Um, uh, specific proposals on immigration policy would have different effects. It in part depends upon who you're allowing in on immigration. Uh, the level of education and skills do make a difference. So if you're getting people with high education levels, there actually is evidence that those people, not only do they add to your labor force, they actually add to productivity. If you add folks who are less skilled and more basic, they don't add to productivity like that, and there is some issue of, of whether or not they suppress wages for, for low-income folks as well. So the, the mix matters. Sure. But the basic formula is if you just allow immigration, you increase your labor force and you increase growth. Historically, we've had pretty high uh, labor force growth rates in part because we've had fairly high immigration. One of the things that you see is recent immigrants actually typically have higher birth rates than others do. So the actually, you get an extra little, you, we've gotten an extra little kick in the past in adding to the labor force with that. But again, you're, you're looking, just so sort of base numbers, you're looking about a labor force increase of about 750,000 people per year right, right. in your projections. Right. Now, let me just say, when we, when we were, were really going gangbusters in, in economic growth, it's late 1990s, it was more than immigration, right? It was also that women's labor force participation was rising to historical levels. And so women closed that gap, so we actually had this extra boost in the labor force. And from what we've seen since then is that gap is now closed and it's now pretty constant. So we don't really expect that to close anymore in the future so you don't have that additional growth in labor force. Okay, thank you very much, very helpful. Senator Perdue. Well, thank you. I didn't know we'd have a unilateral uh, debate going today in the committee, but uh, <laughs> first of all, Dr. Hall, I, I really appreciate your focus on the debt uh, this has been a consistent uh, message that you've delivered each year that you've come here, and I want to thank you personally for that. I personally believe it's the number one crisis we have in America. But I want to, I want to level set this a bit. You talk about the public debt being 78 percent. If we were to include in the nomenclature uh, the debt that we hold in Social Security and Medicare trust funds, um, uh, that it's actually over 100 percent of, of current GDP, uh, if, if that were all included, correct? So it's a matter of really how you level set that. R I want right, to I want right. to come to another question though, particularly at the growth of this to go to 30 from 22 trillion dollars projected in the 2019 from 21 trillion today to 32 trillion dollars next year. Um, the largest growth in that is social security, medicare uh, and interest on the uh, debt. But we've also got um, uh, pension and benefits for federal employees, medicaid and uh, this this interest I want to talk about right now um, it's projected that uh, in the next 10 years, we'll go from 2019 net interest outlays from 383 to 928 True. billion by 2029 uh, of this. So can you elaborate a little bit on um, the impact of the growth of interest? And we're still assuming a low relative interest rate compared to historical interest rates of about 5.5%. Uh, that's right. In fact, we, we do have interest rates going up, and that's a big, big part of this. And the trouble, of course, with interest rates going up is we already have a big debt. So when we start to add to the debt, in large part, the, the things you mentioned are all typically related to aging population. Right. right. Um, when you add that to it, you get this sort of double hit with interest rates and high debt combining on things. But you're right. We have debt. We have interest rates going up to a, what's a more normal range, but we're still at the low end of the normal range. Right. And that makes a big difference. If interest rates were just a percentage point higher than we forecast, then we're talking about an extra two trillion in debt over the next ten years. Yeah, you projected in an earlier report that by 2023 we'd be spending more on interest on the debt uh, than we are on our military. Uh, right, and that's all defense spending. And that's still in our projection. At the end of ten years, uh, the the spending on net interest is is greater than all of defense spending. So let me move to the two things that are going up uh, the fastest because of the aging population: Medicare and Social Security. Right. Um, you know, total spending is, is, is uh, at an all-time high as a percentage of GDP. Uh, but when we look at Social Security, 
you know, the trust fund of Social Security actually disability goes to zero as projected. You project by 2027. Right. And I think the retirement part goes by 2032. Right. Uh, I don't think the public fully appreciates the weight of that observation. And uh, so what really happens when they go to, and by the way, we're subsidizing this year, Social Security about $100 billion, and I think uh, Medicare by about $380 billion, uh, right out of the current account. Um, so if those two trust funds actually were allowed to go to zero, right. then the only way to continue paying benefits at 100% is to take that deficit or that shortfall out of the current federal income tax, which is right. something that we've really never, ever projected to, to do. So in your mind, what is the, the impact of this? And, and frankly, if we don't address that, no matter how the economy grows, how you cut expenses, or what you do with the budget process, or what you do with health care, you really can't bring the debt curve back down to some reasonable percentage over any length of time without addressing those pieces of it. Would you agree? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, the part I agree about is, is, is not to recommend particular things, but you need to find big changes. You need to find big sources of, of big cuts in spending or, or big increases in taxes or both. You can't look at the small things agree. and get there. But when you're spending $1.3 trillion in discretionary right. and over $3 trillion in mandatory, wouldn't you agree that the only way really to curb, bend this curve is to attack all the costs? You can't do it. You can't get to a, solving a trillion-dollar deficit by going after $1.3 trillion of expenses on discretionary spending. That just isn't going to work. Well, you, that, can't, yeah. you can't really raise revenue fast enough to do that. You really can't cut enough spending out of discretionary spending. Right. So the only way to go is to save Social Security and save Medicare. By save, I mean avoid it, either trust fund going to zero. Um, th that's reasonable logic. I, I, I think the, the discretionary spending is, is not a big bucket, and it by, it by itself would not solve the problem. Right. Thank you. I, I, again, thank you so much for the executive summary. This is so helpful, and I encourage you to continue to do that. It's right. very, very helpful. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Brown. Thank you, Chairman Enzi and um, Dr. Hall. We had uh, a get-together in my office, and I had a few questions for you then, and you got me good answers. Um, most people wouldn't look forward to being on a budget committee when I've learned how we've worked so hard, you know, to try to tell the truth. Um, I know... Uh, uh, State of Indiana, you know, we have pa passed a balanced budget amendment. That certainly makes it easier. You know, we've, d we've done it out of practice. Uh, being on a school board 10 years, being the CEO of my own business, it'd be laughable if in any of those gigs that you'd run the operation like that. Um, I'm going to take a little different tact here. And a great presentation in terms of the facts and figures. The other side many times indicates that we can raise income to offset, you know, our troubles here in the budget. And I ask you a few particular questions, and I was amazed at the answer that came back. And I'm going to start with this one. Uh, to eliminate a deficit, you came back with the answer, taxes would have to go up across the board 33 percent. I want to make sure that that was correct, because that's a huge number, and that's just a great example of how far we're out of kilter. Is that you said one-third? Um, well, we, we, they go up by one-third. If you raise the tax rate, the tax rate would have to go up by, by 10 percent across the board. Okay, so that's good to clarify that. That's a huge tax increase. And then I think you also, when I was looking at the higher income brackets, right. and uh, the highest single bracket is 510,000, and the one just taxed at two percentage points lower is 204,000. And then the married equivalents would be 408 and 612. And let me understand this correctly. Did you say if you taxed fully through those brackets, meaning at 100%, it would not gener generate enough revenue? That's right. You can That's... Okay, if you taxed all income over 204000 and 408000 for married couples, you could not raise enough revenue to pay for our deficit. That, to me, is appalling. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, couch terms in ways that people will understand it, and we just got to do a better job than that. And... That would be, and I was disappointed when I got here and heard that uh, 
uh, several times we've tried to address spending bills and can't get those ever to catch stride. But it looks like it would nearly be impossible if you did what many claim out there in terms of the very top rates, you just could not generate enough income for us to balance our budget. So I think you don't need much more than an eighth grade education to understand the arithmetic here. Uh, politically, uh, some think that you could tax your way out of it. Uh, we've got, to me, what appears to be a spending problem that's been accumulating over many years. Revenues are currently rising faster than the growth of the economy. Is that true? Um, that's right. Okay. So you couldn't tax incomes at 100% and still cover the deficit. We're generating more income uh, faster than the rate of the growth of the economy. Uh, it looks to me that the answer is simple, and it's more about backbone and fortitude, and we're going to have to start addressing the mandatory spending and doing things that are kind of across the board if we're ever going to cut into this issue that it's not snuck up on us. I'll, I'll, I'll pass on agreeing because we don't, we don't comment on policy, but... I, I understand, and I, I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, thanks for being here today. W what would be the impact on our uh, GNP if America d adopted a, a, a so-called merit immigration policy like Canada? Or Australia, uh, we'd have to we'd have to look at that. I, I I I'm not I'm not sure exactly how that's different. We'd we'd have to. I wouldn't want to try to guess. We'd have to look at it carefully and and, and analyze it carefully. Well, would it cause it to go down? Um, I, I'm 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 afraid I'm just not that familiar with with the the Canadian system. Well, the Canadian and Australian system basically uh, basically admit uh, folks to their country based on their economic, potential economic contribution, as opposed to, to, uh, to our system, we, we basically admit people who have family. Right. Would you look at that for me? Sure, sure. You know, I, I can say, which, which is a relevant statistic, I think, is the evidence is that, that people with higher levels of education as immigrants uh, do contribute to productivity growth. Yeah, as well as their work, so so that that has a sort of a different effect than others who are who are less skilled. What uh, what role briefly does labor force participation rate play in uh, GDP? Uh, it's a it's a very important role. It's it's a really it's a really key part of, of getting GDP growth. And, and what's our what's our labor force participation right now? About point uh, six two something like that. Yeah, it's like a little under sixty three percent right now. And, and we see it going down, unfortunately, as the baby boomers age and start to retire. So right now it's been, actually the rate has actually been holding for a little bit, but we expect it to start to decline and that's starting to be a, a, a burden on growth going mm -hmm. forward. Um, if if a government social programs pay more than one could earn through an entry-level minimum wage job, would that have an impact on GDP? Well, let me just say, in general, we look at the at the marginal tax on labor. You know, when 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 uh, when things happen, for example, even the income tax is a marginal tax on labor. So, when the marginal tax on labor goes up, we think labor supply goes down. Well, let me put it another way: if you add up all of our our welfare programs, mm -hmm. TANF, Medicaid, food stamps, et cetera. Um, they pay someone more than the minimum wage in 35 states. Does that, does that sound right? Uh, th yeah, that, that sounds right, but I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they pay more than, than uh, $15 an hour in 13 states. Mm -hmm. in, in my state, uh, uh, one parent and two children would make $27,000 tax-free. You can't do that in a minimum wage job. That that discourages people from joining the workforce, does it not? Again, that that sort of thing thing is contributes to a, a high tax rate on working in, in, in our marginal tax. That rate. that that discourages people from joining the labor force, does it not? It could have an impact. 
I, I'm hesitate to say because I, we haven't done the analysis, and we, yeah. we try to be really careful about about when we talk about things that we've actually right. looked at specifics. Right. All right. I want to ask you about the shutdown. No, nobody wanted the shutdown. Nobody's for a shutdown, and I don't want you to construe my remarks as implying otherwise. Uh, can we agree that the uh, the, the American economy, our, our gross national product, is about twenty trillion dollars a year. That's right. Yes. That's like twelve zeros, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I understand. Maybe they're your numbers. That the uh, the shutdown cost eleven billion dollars. Is that right? That was our estimate. Yes. But we're going to recover eight billion, right? That's right. That leaves three billion that we're out, right? Yes. If. Um, do you happen to know what did you look at? What percentage three billion or twenty trillion is? It's it's not it's not a big percentage. It's a um, it's I, about oh two percent of one percent. That that sounds that sounds about right. Okay, so so how how come so many economists are saying the world is going to spin off its axis? <laughs> We're talking about. Nope. I'm not defending a yeah. shutdown. I'm just trying to to understand basic math. You're talking about sure. point oh two percent. Of one percent, right? Am I right? Well, that's right, and, and I I don't want to defend somebody else's analysis, um, but we we did produce these numbers that you're that you're quoting. All right, I'm 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 out of time. Thank you for coming, Doc. I have an adjourned report. Thank you, uh, Senator Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm honored to be on the committee, and. I want to follow up with what Senator Kennedy's talking about because maybe there's more to it than simply a linear number, and, and I suspect there is. But let, let's go to the next step. Let's say that we were able to reform our process so that we could institutionalize a prohibition, if you will, basically on any future government shutdowns. Would there be a way to, to, to score that, um, the value of that, of never having to worry about one again? And I don't, you know, not just to federal workers who would right. be guaranteed a paycheck, but the, the, you know, the economy that requires and depends on those government services to keep rolling along. I mean, would, would there be some way to, to add a value to that? That, that would be a challenging estimate. We'd, we'd struggle with that. I'll bet it would be. Um, because it seems to me, as we talk about all these pieces of this formula, that economic growth is the one that we've had some, that we've been fairly good at. Uh, it's, it also seems to me that as the economy grows, there should be less need for government, not more need, except for maybe infrastructure, things like that. I want to go back to the earlier discussion, though, about immigration, because we have such a generous immigration policy, and workforce shortage is real. And it, it does stifle economic growth. I believe all of that. Is there any way, sort of tagging on again to, to maybe what Senator Kennedy was talking about, is there any way to uh, score, say, 100% of the, of the million legal immigrants per year if they were all merit-based? In other words, all of them had a skill set, whether it's an H-2A you know, seasonal farm skill set or an H-1B um, you know, engineering, software engineer uh, skill set. Is there any way to determine how the contribution that would make to the economy, thus revenue and less demand for government service? Um, I think that's something that, if we spend a little time, we could we could uh, get a handle on. I think it would be valuable to do that, as we are having these discussions, um, particularly the immigration discussion, apart from apart from border security, but immigration policy. It seems to me. Comprehensive immigration reform has become the hardest thing in this town to do, and yet when I look at all the pieces of it, um, while each one of them is, has its own complexities, there's plenty of reason for us to do it. And uh, we get caught up on numbers, we get caught up on caps, we get caught up on you know per, you know, per country caps, we get caught up on, on all of these things, and yet I don't know I don't know anybody that doesn't couldn't be convinced of a benefit if we had a good economic score on what. In fact, let me even back up further. I'd even submit to you that the number of immigrants that we allow per year isn't even relevant if, if we allow the right, the right type of people with the right skill sets and education that would fit the economic demands and workforce demands of, of our economy. And I would love to see CBO, and, or anybody else for that matter, do a, a, a real thorough analysis 
of, of what that might be. Because I can think of some of my skeptical friends that might be convinced of, uh, you know, of a different argument. Yeah, we, one of the things we, we, we could do in the nearest, I don't know if anybody else has done some sure. research like that. We can, we can look at it a little bit. And if you'd like to follow up, we'd like to sort of tell you what we found in terms of current evidence. I, I would be interested in that. I, I think it'd, okay. be, it'd, it'd be helpful to me, I know, and I think it could be um, fascinating otherwise. Um, you know, I think, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll just yield back. Thank, and thank you. Thank you, and thanks for being here, and thanks for choosing this committee. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hall, when you exclude intergovernmental transfers, which is just the federal government moving money from its right pocket to its left pocket, spending on Social Security and Medicare will exceed their dedicated revenues by eight and three tenths trillion dollars between 2020 and 2029. Are these programs fiscally sustainable? Uh, the, the, the trust funds are, are, are going, yeah. going, going to be exhausted. Without legislative action, what year do you project that Social Security Disability Insurance Trust Fund and Medicare's Hospital Insurance Trust Fund will be exhausted, and what happens when they are exhausted? Well, the disability, we think, will be exhausted in 2027. And under current law, that would mean then that the uh, benefits paid out would be constrained by the amount of money in the trust fund. So right away, that would uh, lower the, uh, the benefits by about 10%. Right after that, that was exhausted. With the hospital trust fund that ends in 2026, and there's a similar effect under current law, the uh, outlays would have to decline um, to match the, the incoming uh, uh, money for the trust fund, and that would decline like 14% the first year. Thank you. I'm also deeply troubled, as a number have already mentioned, by the national debt. Some have suggested, however, that the economic costs of debt are small, or even that the debt doesn't matter at all. Can you elaborate on the potential consequences of our high and rising federal debt? What about the claim that we don't need to worry about debt because the federal government can always print more money? Well, let, let, me, let me mention what we think the uh, potential consequences are. Um, first, uh, as interest rates rise to more typical levels, um, federal spending and interest payments will take more and more of the federal budget. And that, that's why uh, I like to point out that, that, it, that federal spending and interest payments in 10 years are going to be about 3% of GDP. That's going to be higher than all defense spending. It's also going to be higher, or it's also higher than all discretionary non-defense spending. So interest, interest payments are going to be a bigger and bigger part of the budget. Uh, second, um, Federal borrowing reduces the capital stock over time. So we get slower productivity, lower productivity, which means lower economic growth and lower wages for folks. Uh, third is lawmakers have limited flexibility in bad times. Um, if you look at that visual summary that we gave out, there's this nice graph uh, on the very first graph on it that has the debt, the historical deficits level year by year. And you can just see recessions here. In 1980, you see the deficits go up. 1990, 2001, 2008, they all start from a relatively low, lowish level and get significantly higher. Right now, we have a really high deficit at 4.4%. 4 if we run into another business cycle, it's really going to go up from that. It's going to limit policymakers' ability to deal with another recession. In a force, the likelihood of a, of a financial crisis would increase. And by that, really, we mean interest rates spiking over what, where they are now, over our projection. Um, we've got a really nice rule of thumb. If they, if they increase by, say, a, a percentage point, we're, we're talking about $2 trillion in debt over 10 years. So it's, it's a really significant thing. Now, those that claim that we shouldn't worry about debt, um, we disagree with that. Uh, we think that continued borrowing, and this is based on past experience, continue borrowing, interest rates are going to go up. They're going to go up to normal levels. They won't stay down. Um, and we believe that printing more money to accommodate that will lead to higher inflation and higher interest rates. So we don't think that will work, although it's an interesting theory. We'll, we'll try to follow that. But the, but the fact is that, that our view of past experience is that, that that won't work going forward. Thank you. Senator Kane, did you vote? I'm not, it's not your turn yet, but <laughs> okay. 
2018 was a good year for the U.S. economy. CBO estimates that the economy grew three and one tenths percent last year, the fastest annual growth since 2005. And while CBO predicts growth may not be as high going forward, the new report makes it clear that the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act will continue to have a positive effect on the economy over the next decade. Director Hall, can you expand on how the new tax code is expected to improve incentives to work, save, and invest over the next several years? Okay. Um, the important impacts on growth from the, from the tax bill are one, there was a reduction in the effective marginal tax rates in labor income. This is primarily the, the lower individual income taxes. We think that will stimulate um, workers entering the labor force. We think the labor force will be bigger. We think the labor force will average about 600,000 more on average over the next 10 years because of the Tax Act. And we think that workers will work more hours. And the hours will be the equivalent of about another 800,000 workers. So that won't be trivial. That will be higher GDP growth and, importantly, higher potential GDP growth. The second effect was higher effective marginal tax rates on, on capital income. Uh, and that's primarily from lower tax rates in business income. That means higher capital, higher productivity. And the bottom line in both these things, <coughs> we think real GDP over the next decade will be about seven-tenths of a percent higher than it would have been without the Tax Act. So the, so the effects, we think, are, are, um, are measurable. And in our earlier estimate about a year ago, we're still comfortable with. We still think this will be the impact of the uh, Tax Act going forward. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kane. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Hall. Let me just ask while we're on the tax bill. So mm -hmm. before the chairman's question to you about the growth effect, you were talking about negative uh, aspects of a debt and deficit effect. Right. Have you netted out, you know, your, your thoughts about the tax bill's impact on growth with the uh, negative effects of its um, impact on the debt and deficit? Yeah, that's a tough judgment to make. In fact, that's, that's sort of a, above our, our prey grade. But I can tell you that, that we, we did not estimate that the Tax Act would generate so much growth that it would pay for itself. Mm -hmm. We do think the growth will, will result in higher revenue, but the higher revenue is um, maybe about 30 percent of, uh, of the cost of the tax bill. So, you know, the, you've heard the line, will the tax bill pay for itself? By our estimate, it will pay for about 30 percent of itself through the higher growth. And then depending upon these other economic factors and then how big a burden our debt turns out to be, if we enter a down cycle and because of debt we're not able to use some of the tools we've used in the past to deal with the down cycle, then you would start to see more of the real impact of the, of the, uh, the debt number that's occasioned by the tax bill. Right. We certainly think the high debt level and rising debt level does create some risk for the economy. In, uh, let me ask you this. So I've been seeing reports recently about a dramatic slowdown in the housing market, uh, you know, 19 to 18, uh, and some real significant concerns there. Um, did you deal with that at all uh, in the uh, economic uh, outlook that, uh, that you put into this report? Yes, actually, we, we, we do forecast the housing market as part of our forecast. And so we, we do adjust that every year. We sort of look at the recent data and, and see where we think that's heading. And, and do you share the, I mean, I've been reading in sort of, you know, common trade publications, Business Insider, Wall Street Journal, housing trade publications, slowing housing market. Do you also, uh, in your predictions, see a slowing housing market as sort of a likely reality in the next year or two? I, I think that's right. I, I'd have to double check with our with our housing analyst, but but I but I think that's right. I don't think we're we're being surprised by anything at this point. And do you have uh, thoughts about the causes of that? Is that just is it rising interest rates? Is it overbuilding, overcapacity? Was it you know is there a, a tax bill effect on salt deductibility or 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 uh, home mortgage interest deductibility? I mean, any of do you you make a projection? Do you attribute it to factors? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the mortgage deductibility part, we, we do think is going to have an effect, and that's sort of in our, in our forecast. Uh, a lot of the general slowdown, though, we think is, is the, the stimulus from the tax bill is still in place, but it's, it's waning over time, and that's a big part of what the slowdown is, we think. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, th this is where we get into beyond this year, we think it'll actually slow down to below potential for a little while as, as we uh, 
readjust to that lack of stimulus mm -hmm. at some point. One thing that I don't think you put into your projection, because hopefully we wouldn't need to put it into our projection, deals with the upcoming decision that Congress might have to make about the debt ceiling. Um, I'm assuming in your factoring in, you do not include some chance of, you know, Congress uh, running up against some default on the debt ceiling or precipitous action on the debt ceiling that of the, of the type that led to a downgrading of U.S. credit in 2011. Am I correct that you are not making an assumption that we would do something stupid about the debt ceiling? That, that's correct. And so your, your advice to us, although I, I know you're giving us analysis rather than advice, is don't do something stupid about the debt ceiling. Well, I'll try not to give advice, but, but the, uh, the, the stupid, if I were going to give advice, I'd say something like that. Because, because doing something stupid about the debt ceiling could have a significant negative impact uh, on the economy, correct? Well, you know, we'd have to think it through. I, I don't, I don't want to project something like that. Um, uh, you know, I, actually, I think there, there's some who differ a little bit as to how much impact that would have, so I don't want to Explain that to me. So, you know, as a, as a former governor and senator, to me, anything that, you know, suggests that you're close to default or, you know, right. we're, not, we're not good for the promises that we've made, you know, th those would have been... My, my financial advisors, when I was governor, for example, said that would be cataclysmic to do something like that. Do not do that. Or when I was mayor, you know, you're getting a bond rating. It, it would be really stupid for your costs of borrowing for you to suggest any unreliability over matters of being good on your debt. Uh, what would the argument be that maybe flirting with the debt ceiling may not be so difficult? Well, um, a lot of it is there, there still remains a, a great deal of trust in the, in the federal government as a borrower. As long as people trust that the government's a safe place to, to loan money to, then the U.S. government's not going to have a premium on when they borrow. Mm -hmm. So I, it is probably likely that we're pretty far from, from um, having really concerns about whether, whether there's a loss of faith in the federal government's ability to pay back its debts. Mm -hmm. But anything that would contribute to any decline in confidence could have some negative well, impact, and it might be right. significant depending right. upon how Right. catastrophic or how irrational the actions of Congress and the administration would be. Yeah, and that's sort of what we're talking about. We're talking about an extreme. We talk about a financial, uh, a financial um, a crisis. We're really talking about a, a severe drop in the, the faith of the federal government's ability to pay things back. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as we've talked about, uh, having the U.S. government have to pay a premium on its borrowing is, is not a good thing, not only for the the, for the budget, but also probably for economic growth. Right, and just and your Senator point. White House. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Hall. I appreciate you being here. I wanted to ask you about two things. The first is health care spending. Um, I keep showing you this graph that is one of my most interesting puzzles. Um, which indicates that in the 2019 to 2029 period, compared to extension of your projection for this period, based on the same terms that we project here, you end up with a net savings in that 10-year period of $4.7 trillion in total federal health care spending. Um, about this much is actual, and then on it goes to uh, projection. But clearly something has happened in there. I, I believe there have been estimates that about 400 billion of this 4.7 trillion uh, has to do with the changes in the individual mandate. But that still leaves 4.3 trillion. So I would ask you uh, again to please work with us to try to understand what on earth is going on it could be that all your boffins with their log algorithms don't actually know, but I'd like to get a better understanding of it because if you can lower over in a 10-year period our health care spend by $4.3 trillion without really hurting anybody, whatever happened, we want to do more of it. So will you pledge to work with us and try to understand that better? Yeah, and, and the one thing I'd... I'd, I'd... You know, we, we have limited ability to do our own research, so we, we rely on outside research much more than, than we do on our own research. We do what we can, so a lot of what we're lacking is just well, if you could somebody's task, research. Figure out who it is that you could task in that outside research to explain this. 
would be helpful, and we'll follow up separately. Okay. Absolutely. The second thing I wanted to ask you about goes back to um, your answer to a question for the record by Ranking Member Sanders in April 6 of 2017, a very simple statement that climate change may affect the nation's economic output. Now, since that date, we've seen two pretty serious warnings emerge, um, economic warnings related to climate change. The first is probably best uh, exemplified by Freddie Mac saying that they expect a coastal property values crash, or at least a coastal property values crash is possible, which in its economic impact and scale would match the economic impact and scale of the 2008 mortgage meltdown, which we lived through and don't want to have to go through again. So that's out there, and a lot of people have written and talked about it, but Freddie Mac is probably the biggest and uh, most non-environmentally specific organization, you know, with a lot of expertise, but has made that warning. So that's one. The second one is that the Bank of England is warning about a carbon asset bubble crash. And they use the term to define the impact of that crash, systemic risk. Um, do you know what the Bank of England means when it says systemic risk? Well, I know what the term generally means, but I'm not familiar with this. Well, generally, on that, yeah. I describe it as the blandest term uh, that is the most terrifying two words economically one can think of. It basically means global economic collapse or slippage, significant slippage, correct? Right. It means that the problem goes beyond the carbon companies and out into the general economy the same way that the sure. 2008 crash went beyond the mortgage companies and out into the general economy, correct? Uh, yes. So those two things are now out there as warnings. Have you looked at either of those warnings either on the merits or to see were they to come true, what would that mean for your projections? Sure. Um, well, one of the things that we've done, and, and uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile mentioning, we do have a report from a couple of years ago looking at the effect of increased um, hurricane frequency and, and uh, intensity. Yeah. On the flood insurance program, emergency fund spending, exactly. all that. And that's certainly relevant to the property yeah. part but from Freddie Mac. Although, uh, just to be clear, this is actually quite different. Is it? Because um, it is not an evaluation of the immediate impact of right. sea level rise or offshore storms or whatever. It's an evaluation of what happens to confidence in coastal property values okay. when banks won't give you a mortgage because they don't know that the property is going to be there 30 years from now and you can't get insurance because you don't know what the tail end risk is if you're the insurer which makes it really hard to sell coastal property, which creates the meltdown long ahead of and independent of any particular storm. My time has run out, so let me follow up with questions for the record to make sure that we're okay. on record, and I'd lo love to follow up and get answers from you in those sure. three areas. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to thank Dr. Hall for his testimony today. Your full statement will be in the record. Information to all senators. Questions for the record are due by noon tomorrow with a signed hard copy delivered to the committee clerk at Dirksen 624. Under our rules, our witness will have seven days from receipt of the questions to respond with answers. With no further business before the committee, this hearing is adjourned. I'm going to go vote.
we want to get into what we're going to do. We, we had a little imbalance in the hearing. I like how it turns out. Yeah. We should always do that. Seems like more cordial. Actually, yeah, there was uh, sort of a nice discussion. Here. Tomorrow on C-SPAN 3, a conference.